Welcome, students, to this intro introduction to how to write a scientific lab report in the natural sciences. Uh, this video is meant as uh, if it's meant to be a video you can come back to whenever you're writing a lab report here at school, and uh, we can watch the relevant sections of the video for the part you're working on. For example, if you're all about to write an introduction, maybe you want to refresh on how to do that, you can come back here and just watch that part. So you doesn't, don't have to watch all of this video uh, all at once, but do it smartly, I'd say. So this is my introduction to how to write a scientific lab report in natural sciences. First and foremost, a lab report consists of several sections. These are the title, with a possible subtitle, introduction, which contains a, a, an aim as well as the last section of the introduction, a section called materials and methods, a section called results, and a section called discussion. Uh, please, uh, I urge all of you to start working in the template that you can find on its learning. Uh, and then just uh, fill in in the appropriate parts of the template. Then you will get the formatting almost done immediately, which might be simpler for you. Okay, the title. The title is the part that piques the interest of your readers. And it's the first thing you look for when you're searching scientific articles. The first thing you see are their titles. And they should be interesting and scientifically correct. For example, say that you're uh, looking through toxicological sciences. Uh, then the first thing you see when you come to various types of articles is the titles, like this one. Uh, the toxic equivalency factors for dioxins and dioxin-like compounds. Uh, for someone who uh, has worked in environmental chemistry, this title tells me exactly what this article is going to contain. Uh, especially, you can re I can really tell that it's something I'm looking for because these are values used today for everyone working with dioxins. So a title got to be spot on and tell the readers exactly what they're looking at. Um, a tip for this would be to formulate your title once you've finished the rest of your report though. So the last thing you should be working on is your title. Because it's easier to formulate a title once you've given everything a lot of thought, written a very in-depth discussion and you really know what you're working on, then it's time to write a title. It will be the best once you've done a thorough discussion. Okay, and what more about the title? Well, it should be no more than a sentence. Sometimes we can have a subtitle, for example, if we have made an extensive work, uh, for example, uh, some extended essays later in the IB, for example, or if you find it hard to give all the relevant information you want in a sentence. Sometimes you might need to give two sentences and then you can have the second sentence as a subtitle. Uh, and as an example we have my old master thesis here where I had to write a first a title which should be should reach like a general public and then I give some additional details in the subtitle down here. Okay. Uh, but the introduction, save that for last. The introduction, though, you can write, um, depends a little bit, but you could start writing an introduction after you've done an experiment as well. That's fine. Uh, the introduction is there to provide your readers with relevant background information and theory. Uh, I would say that in, instead of splitting this uh, this part of the report up into separate titles, uh, introduction one, do, 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 use several paragraphs of text instead of excessive use of uh, subtitles. Um, for the simple reports that you're going to start with, I would say that you only have an introduction as a main 
main uh, title in this section and then a aim as a subtitle lower down. Uh, the language, how do we formulate a scientific language? Well, in this part of the report you do not have to write in past tense. However, you need to be scientific in the way you formulate your language and your words, and you have to be formal. Since you're providing your readers with information, background information, you need to give appropriate citations to your references as well. And uh, we'll get in on we'll, we'll get into how to how you do that. Um, you should also give your reader the information as to why the study was performed in the subtle shape of a subtitle called AIM. And I would say, a simple report, you shouldn't write an introduction that's longer than a page. Half a page, a page should be fine. So, let's get into this, the language here a little bit. Uh, here you have two examples, and uh, we're going to compare them a little bit. To the left, you can see uh, the column of text, and it says, I like the idea that water can be bound in crystals. That's rad. A cool salt like that with water bound in crystals is copper sulfate. It turns blue according to Wikipedia. Happy face. Well, there's a lot of things here we can get into. First and foremost, we have words, personal words such as I or we. We generally tend to avoid them. Uh, the introduction might allow for the use of one or two of those, but as a general rule, don't write personal words such as we, I, us, things like that. And that you like something that's a subjective thing, not nothing, and we want to keep an objective viewpoint when we're doing with chemistry and uh, doing science. So uh, what you like is not really relevant, you want to get background information that's objective. That's rad is also your personal viewpoint. So now let's not get into that. Cool salts, I mean the language here isn't very very formal. Uh, a salt cannot be cool in that sense. Uh, cool would be mean cold in this case. And, uh, uh, it turns blue according to Wikipedia. Here you have a citation to a source which is uh, not correctly done. Uh, we don't write according to blah de blah in a scientific lab report, uh, but we cite our sources in a different way. And of course, no happy smileys in our lab reports. So let's not let's not do and let's not write our text in the format as is shown here to the left. I also have an example here to the right. Water molecules bound in crystals of solid compounds are referred to as water of crystallization. Many ionic, many ionic compounds tend to trap water molecules in their crystal structures as they form. An example is washing soda, Na2CO3, with 10 water molecules bound in, or copper sulfate, CuSO4 times 5 water molecules, Anders Schon et al. 2012. By the process of do to do. This language is this use of language is way better. Let's see. First and foremost, it's nothing about what you personally think. There's no uh, words, personal words such as I, uh, we, us. It gives objective information, uh, examples, and then citing a source according to the correct format. Uh, so, strive to write like this, instead of the part to the left. When we cite references, well, it's part of the scientific language. In our case, we will cite sources using the Harvard APA system, and it looks like this. It depends on whether or not your source is a book, a web page, or a lot of other things. Uh, so we'll get into where you can find more information about how to exactly cite your specific type of source. I will give you a link at the end of this video as well, uh, when when I get to the reference list. But for example, citing use a source uh, in a text and you cite a book, 
you would write it in this format, sunt minason, ok, here it's in Swedish, hold on. I've translated this not fully, ok. Sund Minason and Viboy 2008. So we give surnames of authors and the year for the copyright. That's it, in a parenthesis of course, and at the end of sentences or possibly paragraphs. If we have a book with more than three authors, well, in that case we give the surname of the main author and then add et al. Uh, like here, Sund et al. 2008. Et al. means et alia, if I recall, and that means and others in Latin. Uh, so you make sure that your parenthesis isn't too long by writing et al. instead. And then, of course, you give the year of the copyright of the book. Uh, finally, example web page, because uh, I, uh, I suspect that you're going to try and cite web pages in our reports, uh, and then you give the name of the specific organization, and then the year the web page was last edited, if you can. Otherwise, for beginners like us, we can also write the year we collect the information, if we cannot find a date when the page was last edited. Here we have an example of citations, and I've taken this piece of text from a, uh, a bachelor thesis uh, from Rebo University. You can find the, the title of it in the top. Um, and this is taken from the introduction of that report. Talk about different mes methods to achieve different degrees of substitution, relevant to the industries, giving background information to the uh, content at hand. And they go on, types of plant, the type of plant the cellulose is refined from also affects the characteristics of the end product in table two. So we're referring to tables here, which is good. And then you can see at the end here, we have a Fernandez de la Osa et al, 2012, Johansson, 2009. And this is what you should strive to do. You give a citation to a source at the end of, for example, a paragraph. If you've borrowed, like taken values from a specific place, you can also cite sources like has been done here. Like table two is borrowed from chemistry and technology of explosive volume two by Urbanski. Okay. Then we're going to have a subtitle here that's called AIM. The AIM gives the aim of the study, that is why did you perform the experiment you performed. And it's the last section of the introduction, so you finish off by giving the AIM. Uh, and of course we don't write because I had to or because the teacher told me to, rather try to state what the goal of the experiment was. We're practicing how to write a scientific report and we're pretending that we did the study of our own free will because we wanted to figure something out. Um, it cannot be more than one or two sentences. You write it in passive form using past tense. For example, the aim of this study was to investigate how the concentration of calcium carbonate influences the rate of reaction between calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. You see here, we say what the aim of the study was, because we did, when we write the report, we're referring back to a study that has already been done. And there's no, uh, it's passive, it doesn't say, um, my, it was this aim of the study, instead it's, sorry, it, it doesn't say that my aim was to do this or that. Uh, but rather it says the aim of the study was to, so you remove all of uh, the personal words and such. Okay, materials and methods. Uh, this is a part that mostly consists of linear text. Sometimes people add figures and tables to uh, make it more understandable, more clear. You should not write the material and method section as a recipe. Rather, you should tell 
your reader what you've done and what materials you've used. The language should be in past tense, since you're referring to what you did. It's supposed to be formal and in passive form. I have three examples here, and one of them is going to be correct. The first one. Transfer 5 cubic centimeter solution to the beaker and dilute to 100 cubic centimeters. Well, this is a uh, this is something you suggest that someone do. It's more like a recipe, and that's not what we want to do. So we're not writing instructions for someone in that format. I poured my solution into the beaker. I then diluted it to 100 cubic centimeters. Here you got personal words, right? It's not passive, it's something you did, and we're not, we're, we don't want to formulate ourselves that way, it's not very scientific. I then diluted it to something that you actively did, it's not something that was passively done, it was something that was actively done. So that's not correct. And here we have something that should be better than, let's see. 5 cubic centimeters were transferred into a new 150 cubic centimeter beaker, whereupon it was diluted to 150 cubic centimeters. So let's see. 5 cubic centimeters were transferred. It wasn't something that you did actively. They were passively transferred into a new beaker, whereupon they were diluted to this volume. So it's passive. It's written in past tense. They were transferred. And it was diluted, yeah, so writing in past tense. And it's formal here. So that's, try to strive writing like this. Here you have an example from my master thesis, uh, because that's the quickest text I could get, really. Um, so, prior to filtration, the mass of each sample bottle was determined. The groundwater was then vacuum filtered through polyamide filters, which were which were collected and stored in glass petri dishes. After separating the particulate fraction from the rest of the sample, 6 milliliters of ethanol, internal standard, and 25 drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid were added to the filtrate. You can see where I, I'm not writing here what I did, it, I write what was done instead and in a past tense, and tr strive to write a text in this format. Okay, and once uh, we're done with that part, let's look at our results. This section consists of two main things. First and foremost, linear text describing the acquired results. Then we also fill out with our data in, in the shape of figures. And figures, it's a word that we use for lab reports and in science as a general, it's pretty much uh, pictures and diagrams and graphs of various types. And we also add tables. Uh, again, the text should be written in passive form, past tense, and in a formal fashion. We describe what the results ended up to be. And very, very important when we're working on the results part is that we do not discuss them. We, we describe what the results were and guide readers through the most essential parts of figures and tables. So we state what the results ended up to be, but not why. And that's important. That's something we're saving for the discussion part of the report. So you're just gonna write what your results were, not why they were like they were. And here you have an example. It might be a lot of abbreviations that you're not familiar with, but it's pretty much stating uh, referring to data in the decreasing order of concentration, they were found to do, so we list these in decreasing order, while the other were found in notably lower concentrations and were thus excluded from the figure. As for the general trend, the levels were decreased, so we're describing the trends that we can see. Uh, however, after seven days, a large increase in concentration was observed for many of these compounds. The smallest increase was to do. do, do so, I mean, we going through what the results were, but not why. And that's important. Uh, in our results, when we collect data, we usually collect data in the form of tables because that's uh, in, then we do it in a systematic fashion and well organized fashion. 
Uh, and I would like you to format your tables like this. First and foremost, you gotta you have to give your table a number. So if it's the first in order that comes in your report, you write table one. Otherwise, it's gonna be table two, table three, and so on. Then you give a title for your table up here. It's always above the table. And uh, if we look here, I formatted it like this. So we have different experiment numbers, concentrations of various substances, and mass of a substance here. And by giving the units in each of these titles, I, don't, I can only write values down here. I don't have to write 5.0 mole per decimeter, 4.5 mole per decimeter, and so on, I just write clean, neat values because we've given the units up here as well. And I give it in a nice little parenthesis. So strive to format your tables like this with the table title always above the table. And here you have an example of a figure. For example, it, this is a graph. Um, figure text is always written below a figure. And they're numbered, just the way that tables are. Um, you can have a table one and a figure one, so they're not numbered together or anything like that, but uh, separate from each other. And this is an example of how a figure can look. Uh, we have data points that have been plotted against a x and a y axis. Uh, we have nice clean. Uh, even uh, distances between the data points or between the axes, which is very important to get a, a nice trend, but that, I mean, that's provided by Excel. Uh, very important is that you give the unit and you write, you give an axis title. So you, so you write the title, what you have on each axis, and you write your units there because otherwise it's just numbers and they don't mean anything unless you know what they stand for. Uh, it might be good to uh, include a trend line if you appear to have a systematic trend. It could be exponential, it could be linear like this one, but uh, if you have, uh, if your data points appear to follow some sort of mathematical regression, then you can add a trend line and uh, you can also in Excel choose to get your equation given or an equation for the trend line that has been added, which is neat and good. Mm -mm -mm, hold on. So there we go. So Sorry about that. Uh, I'm doing this rather late in the evening. So, discussion. This is where we tie everything of the report together. And typically it consists of three separate parts. Or three parts, anyway. They don't have to be separate. First and foremost, we are going to have to discuss our results. Uh, what, what they were and the why. Uh, when we try to give a reason as to why, we compare to literature and find suitable sources and then cite them, of course, according to the Harvard APA system, like we did in the introduction. Uh, then you can also discuss your method, what you've done. Uh, what what could have potentially went wrong, sorry, wrong with your experiment? And how can the method be improved? And just yes, by writing human error dot. That doesn't really say anything. You gotta get into details here. What part of the experimental procedure could have been improved? Um, in some cases, it might be very interesting to discuss uh, whether or not other methods could have been used to yield beth better results at the end. And then we have to cite sources as well, where we can find these different types of methods and descriptions of them. And we tie everything together with our A conclusion. What conclusions did you reach through your study and why? Uh, and I mean, typically we want to include all of these three things, uh, but they don't have to be written 
that separately from each other either. Um, I would say that as a rule of thumb, I try to write like three paragraphs in your report, one with discussion of results, one with discussion of method, and then a, one with a conclusion. But I mean, when you discuss your results, they're directly tied to your method, so it's hard to completely separate these. A conclusion is hard to completely separate from the other two parts, but strive to keep them in three different paragraphs uh, as you begin learning how to write a lab report. Uh, for more extensive reports, this doesn't work because we need to give more information and longer discussions. And three paragraphs, each paragraph would be way too long to do that. But for a, as a rule of thumb, for a simple lab report, write three paragraphs, one in each of these parts, and you'll be kind of fine. Let's see here. Discussion. I thought I had done all of this already. Let's see. Here we have an example of a discussion. And I've taken this from my own work as well because um, I haven't had time to look for other things. Maybe I'll update this for the future. Okay, so three aspects. Here we're going to see. We're going to discuss the results a little bit in this. Three aspects of the results jointly points to that the dioxins in the groundwater 100 tube were mainly that groundwater was mainly mobilized on soil colloids. And then I give reasons as to why. Um, the results in the present study suggest that the main dioxin mobilization occurs via association with the salt organic carbon. Do, 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 and you're discussing your results here. It's not the best example, maybe, but it'll have to do for now. And then after your discussions, you get to the reference sections. Who or what have you cited in your report? Well, this is going to be a list of all your references, and they're given in alphabetical order based on the first author's surname or the name of the organization. And some examples of how to write this are given like this. Is your reference a book? Then you write it like in this format. The surname of the first author, then it's uh, it's sorry, his or her first name. Then you do it for the second author, and so on. And you continue until you've given all the authors. Then you give the year of publication. You give the book's title in italics. The edition of the book should not be in italics. Uh, yeah, and the city where the book was published, and then you give the publisher at the end. An example is found down here. You have a last name, a first name, with um, consisting of two parts. A last name and a first name, last name and a first name. A year, the title is given in italics, then we write the edition of the book, and then it was printed, uh, published in Boston at Prentice Hall. By, or by Prentice Hall. If we are referring to a web page, or we've been citing a web page, then we write our source like this. We try to include the name of the author, organization, or governmental agency. Then we write the year when the web page was lastly updated. Then we write the title of the document or the title of the page in italics. Then we write the title or owner of the web page. Then we give a complete link. Finally, we write in these types of brackets when we accessed the document or information. And you have an example down here. Samuelsson Johan, 2012, Fasta kriterier för bedömning täcker inte in allt. Skolverket is the governmental agency in this case. Then we give a complete link and when the link was accessed. Right, and then, I mean, this is right, cite, citing sources correctly and writing references is rather complicated. 
uh, and well, even a uh, someone who's well versed in how to write lab report usually needs to double check on how to do this when they write, especially if they haven't done it for a while. So let's just first separate this citations. That's what you write in the text, and the references are given in the reference list. And that's where you give the complete information of the sources. But if you go to Umeå University Library and to this web page right here, then you can find very good examples of how to write various different types of references and how to cite using the Harvard APA system, for example. When you go to the web page, it will look like this. And then in the list here to the left, you have writing references, Harvard, citing references, Harvard. So this is where you want to go and find out exactly on how to do this. Let's see, they also have, uh, you see here, video guides on how to get them where to get into this more in depth than I have done as well. So uh, I strongly recommend this page. And here you have a example of a reference list. You see it's Okay, it's A and then P, but it's in alphabetical order. You have an organization here in a book. Then we have these are sources fetched fetched from the net. We give links, uh, though I would I'd like to have seen when they were accessed as well. But I mean, there's different types of writing this, but. You should write when you last accessed your source as well. Uh, and this little list was taken from this web page, as you can see down here. So I'm going to cite my sources as well. So it's a picture I took from there. OK. And then finally, in your report, you can also add an appendix after the references. It's used for additional content, things that you do not, you cannot really fit in in other parts of the report, or things that are, don't really belong in other sections of the report, or if it's simply something that you want to include. They're typically never assessed unless your teacher states so ahead of time. For example, your teacher can write, uh, tell you to write a little uh, evaluation of the sources you've used uh, where you discuss them. You can do that in an appendix, but then the teacher will probably, I mean, the, then the t teacher will tell you that it's going to be assessed. But as a rule in science, appendices are not assessed at all. Uh, and you can find various different things in an appendix. You can find raw data, pictures, equations, and so on, um, as long as it's relevant to the study. So it shouldn't be like a picture of your pet because it doesn't really fit into the whole context that we're working with. And here you have, uh, like I did, I had uh, tons of these tables in my appendix uh, with big tables with just raw data. Uh, if you do studies that generate large amounts of data, then you want to process them and give a processed version in your results section and not just page upon page upon page of raw data, especially with data with below detection limits and so. So we present figures and tables in the results section instead. Right. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I know I might have been a bit confusing at times because this is late in the evening. But uh, I wish you all the best of and all good luck when writing these reports, and you'll do great.